Good afternoon to one and all present here. Man is unique, not because he does science, and he is unique, not because he does art, but because science and art equally are expressions of his marvelous plasticity of mind. Hearty welcome to Innova Science Show 2020 Science Expo, a wonderful tool that engages students in learning new facts and inventions with a zeal of interest. God promises in his word that he hears every word that we pray to him. Like a good parent, he is waiting, ready and willing to listen to our needs. Prayer provides the channel to communicate with God and receive supernatural strength and power. Prayer is not asking. It is putting oneself at the hands of God at his disposition and listening to his voice at the depths of our heart. Yes, let's invocate the muses through a prayer song. We feel the divine presence of the Almighty. Small cheer and great welcome makes a merry feast. If the sign on your heart says welcome, then love will come pouring in from everywhere. Here's Ashley Danica to welcome one and all officially to this grand ceremony. Good afternoon, one and all. The soul should always stand ajar, ready to welcome the ecstatic experience. It is my pleasure to welcome each and every one of you who joined the International Webinar and Science Expo Innovo Scientia conducted online by Sacred Heart International School, Pamam Martandam. Firstly, I would like to welcome our Honorable Chairman, Dr. Charles Javakumar, the heart and soul of our school. He is an amazing and adorable person. Every student should try and inculcate some of the values he owns. With utmost pleasure, I welcome you, sir. Next, I would like to welcome our secretary, ma'am, Mrs. Vijaya Javakumar, the pulse of Sacred Heart International School. She extends her love and support to all the high prospects of our school. We are really blessed to have such an ever-shining example of true love and simplicity to guide us then and there. Hearty welcome to this scientific feast, ma'am. Next, I would like to welcome our dearest principal, Mrs. Monsama Joseph. She is always an inspiration and support to each one of us. Thank you, ma'am, for your proper guidance and esteemed presence. 
I feel privileged to welcome our guest of honor, Dr. Martin Sass, the lead scientist, SABIX, the Netherlands, and Dr. Joel Luther Tambi, senior scientist, SABIX, the Netherlands. We acknowledge the presence of such eminent personalities as a true blessing. I, along with all the members of our school, am really glad to, that both of you for sparing your time out of your busy schedule to join us and to boost up our innate potentialities in the field of science and technology. I hope we will be able to seek guidance and imbibe valuable thoughts from your sessions. With great cheer, let me invite the distinguished judges who are here to assess the innovative ideas shared by us. Next, I would like to invite the officials and students from our parent school, Sacred Heart Moga Panja. I hope you will enjoy this feast. With immense pleasure, I would like to welcome Mr. Jawahar, Executive Committee Member, CISCE, New Delhi, a great mentor and our guide. Hearty welcome to Innovo Science Year 2020, sir. Back parents, the backbone of a school. Without you, especially in this time of pandemic, we cannot step forward. We acknowledge the relentless support and timely advice. Welcome you all to Innovo Science Year 2020. Last but not the least, I inv invite our AO sir, all my lovable teachers, supporting staff, well-wishers and students to this so-called function. I hope and request your kind cooperation throughout this program to make it a grand success. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. Emmanuel, can you give human eyebrow to call upon next? Um, give me a clue, please. One who builds character, inspires dream, encourages creativity, builds confidence, instills a love of learning, and touches our hearts in this short span of time. Truly stated, a strong motivator, a dear principal, Mrs. Monsoma Joseph. With extreme ecstasy, we invite you, ma'am, for the presidential address. Deputy Chairman of Sacred Heart Institution, Dr. Charles Jayabukuma, respected Secretary Mrs. Vijay Jayabukuma, Dr. Jawahar, member CIC, the Chief Guest of the Day, Dr. Martin Sass, Lead Scientist Sabik, Dr. Joel Luther Tampi, Senior Scientist Sabik, dear parents, well wishes, my dear colleagues, teaching and non-teaching staff, and most beloved children of Sacred Heart International. I wish to start by quoting the famous British philosopher and mathematician, Bernard Russell. Scientific attitude of mind involves a sweeping away of all other desires in the interest of the desire to know. It's our motive to bring out this creativity and scientific attitude in the children and also to instill international views by expanding the horizon. Science education in the 21st century has different dimension. It is very much important to incorporate digital literacy, inventive thinking and effective communication in their learning procedures. Knowledge and understanding of the basic concepts are the basic requirements of scientific literacy. We believe this is the right time for us to prepare our students with reasonable thinking and 21st century skills. Learning based on hands-on and minds-on experience will definitely enhance conceptualization. Innova Science is such a platform given to our children of grade 1 to 12 to expand their creativity and imaginative power in this period of pandemic crisis. I heartily appreciate and thank the eminent scientists, Dr. Martin Sass and Dr. Joy Luther Tampi for the willingness to share their knowledge with our children. And I really thank the visionary leaders of this institution who always walk steps ahead in giving the maximum and the best for our children. Thanking all of you, especially the parents who have contributed to their children and to the school. 
And I really congratulate all my dear kids who have participated in this program. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am, for your address. Innova Science Fair, a medium through which students represent their learning and hidden talent, amongst others. It gives exposure to the students, exposure to the needs of the society, exposure to new discoveries and inventions, and exposure to working in a group. Really, we feel privileged to have well distinguished eminent personalities as our chief guest today. The great scientists from the Netherlands, Dr. Martin Sass, lead scientist, and Dr. Joel Luther Thumbi, senior scientist, Sabix. Yes. We are all eagerly waiting to know more about our guests of honor and their noteworthy contributions. Our head girl, Ashi Nisheta, is here to introduce our very special guests. Good afternoon. I am profusely elated to take this opportunity to introduce our chief guest of the day, Dr. Martin Sass. Dr. Martin Sass is a lead scientist for Sabic Speciality Business, manages projects and activities for electrical applications of high performance polymers. His 15 years of experience include position of R&D lead engineer for sensor development in automotive industry and system application engineer of embedded systems and MEMS sensor for automotive, healthcare, and consumer electronic products. Dr. Martin holds a master degree in mechanical engineering and a doctorate in applied physics from Slovak Technical University in Slovakia. Dr. Joel Luther Thumbi. Dr. Joel Thumbi is a senior scientist for Sabic Speciality Business. He has more than nine years of industrial experience as a material scientist and project manager, focusing on the development of polymer applications in market segments such as automotive, healthcare, consumer electronic, aerospace, etc. Dr. Thumbi's competency lies in implementing new or improved polymeric and composite solutions and technologies. With proven business and financial project management team leadership skills, Dr. Thumbi holds a PhD degree from well renowned Germany's Technische University of Berlin in the field of material science and modeling, and a master degree in automotive engineering at Fakoschule in Goldstadt, Germany. Dr. Thumbi's bachelor degree is in mechanical engineering from Anna University, Chennai, India. Dr. Joel has three patents, one book, and close to 10 publications in the field of material science and modeling under his name. On behalf of all the members of Sacred Heart family, a warm welcome to you both. Thank you. Thank you, Ashim, for your valuable information. The object of science is knowledge. The objects of art are works. In art, truth is the means to an end. In science, it is the only end. With utmost respect, I invite Dr. Martin Sass, lead scientist from the Netherlands, to empower us through the inaugural address. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for a really uh, fantastic introduction. Well, first of all, let me thank you for having us here today. It's an honor to join you this, uh, this event uh, and to be here with you all. Uh, science and technology are constantly evolving through innovation and in a current dynamic world and turbulent times that we are living in. Uh, we are fighting not only the global pandemic, uh, but a need for a pragmatic and efficient solutions uh, are of a great importance. Uh, one need to realize that being an engineer or scientist, medical doctor, lawyer, teacher, you name it, in any field uh, or at any level, is a lifetime mission of continuous and never ending learning process that should be mainly driven by the inherent person's curiosity and will to help others at the end of the day. So they say uh, he or she uh, has a talent or is gifted. Well, talent is a gift indeed, uh, uh, but it takes a lot of hard work to make a proper use of that talent. And hard work uh, uh, through learning, education, gaining knowledge, experiences, and make a good use of the time that we have been given. So without any uh, further hesitation, please uh, let me inaugurate uh, Innovo Scientia exhibition for the year of 2020. Uh, thank you. Thank you, sir. 
Your commitment to excellence has inspired us a lot, and your words of encouragement to call future scientists is highly appreciable. A ray of light is a ray of hope. Let's move on to the official inauguration of Innova Scientia by lighting the lamp by a chief guest, Dr. Martin Sass, the lead scientist, Savix. Welcome, sir. <laughs> does not diminish despite its repeated use to light many more lamps. So true knowledge does not lessen when shared with or imparted to others. Next, it is the most awaited session, knowledge sharing and open interactive session. The scientist is not a person. He gives the right answers. He's the one who asks the right questions. To lead the healthy open discussion and knowledge sharing, we welcome our honorable dignitaries, Dr. Martin Sass and Dr. Joel Luther Tampi, distinguished scientist, Sabix, the Netherlands. Dear friends, be ready as it is a golden opportunity to get inspired, to apply the scientific method, to conduct independent researches, and to design and develop something new and innovative. We humbly request you, sir, to lead the session. Thank you all, uh, Joel. Uh, are you going to start with your slides? Uh, you're still muted. You have to unmute your mic. Please give us a minute. Okay, wonderful. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Perfect. Uh, sorry. Uh, so I didn't have the rights to unmute myself. Okay, uh, very well. Thank you, everyone, for the you know wonderful opportunity. And uh, just before I go into the topic for today, you know, uh, the most honored uh, chairman of the school, uh, secretary, principal, teachers, and young citizens of tomorrow. Uh, good morning. Of course, for us, it's uh, around. 10 o'clock here, but uh, good afternoon, of course, for you. Uh, the school's uh, quality policy, I went to the internet and I saw that it's achieving excellence in education, adopting quality uh, concepts with continual improvements and molding the students as a responsible citizen. In fact, it's an excellent policy, uh, well suited in the current scenario. I could see from the school records, the quality policy is not just alone on the paper itself, right? So the school thrives to maintain its standards and also, you know, keep it sustainable over the past, uh, let's say, last 10 years uh, and improve it uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, this could be only possible from uh, such a visionary entrepreneur, Mr. Charles Jebakumar. It's concern for the quality means concern for the society, right? So. For this reason, I can easily claim that he's a gift from uh, uh, God Almighty, uh, Jesus Christ. Uh, if Mr. Charles is gift from God, um, as Proverb uh, 1914 says, a prudent wife is from the Lord. So Mrs. Vijaya is the gift uh, from the Lord to Mr. Charles. Um, so both love themselves, love the passion for their work, they work towards, and I do believe that, and that's the key success for this particular school uh, to be one of the top school in India, and as I know, uh, in the locality. Uh, 
the chairman's vision is only completed if uh, somebody holds uh, a, a competent a competent principal holds this office and i see that in uh, mrs monsama joseph with her vast experience in moving the school and i am pretty sure that she will be moving the school ahead in the right direction pomum grows very fast after the school has established let's say 10 years and as a native of pomum let's say martandam uh, it's a great privilege and i'm so amazed to see that uh, such a fantastic growth of the school in such a short period of time and i am seeing this from the outset and i want to congratulate the whole uh, administration uh, the 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 uh, the management and everybody including the teachers the faculties and the students uh, and i wish uh, the school to be the lighthouse and the hub for producing such a quality students for uh, the future generation and also to be a good citizen of uh, india so i wish a good luck and i also want to thank um, uh, mr uh, uh, sajan uh, for you know uh, doing all the coordination and also uh, providing all the technical uh, support for you know conducting this particular function so with that said uh, no more uh, you know philosophy let me straight get into the matter so let me start by sharing my screen so it's going to be a very interesting session so let's see if you can uh, see my screen. Yes, it's in full screen. OK, perfect. OK, great. Again, a great warm welcome and uh, good afternoon, one and all, uh, to the Innova Science Show. And we prepared some very good uh, materials, pages, and uh, nice stuff. Um, before I just go ahead and uh, you know uh, give you a lot of uh, this, um, I don't want this to be a lecture. So I want this to be, and uh, myself and also together with Martin, and we, we were discussing and we want this session to be not so formal. We want this session for, from our side to be highly interactive and interesting for us also to, to you know, just feel free to uh, interrupt us any point of time. It's not going to be a lecture. You know, like uh, just uh, feel free to interrupt us, ask questions. And we have some interesting trivia. So we also have some interesting questions that I will be going across the slides. Uh, and I'll be asking this question and anyone, especially the students, if you feel free, just go ahead and, and you know, answer it. And uh, I assure you, uh, I mean, uh, for the correct answer, when I'm back to India, I'll be able to give the gift to the right students uh, for that. Uh, so I don't know, like, let me see. Okay. I, I just want to confirm if you can still see my screen. So, uh, okay. Uh, so let's start with the contents for today. Um, the main content that I want to cover, uh, together with, uh, Martin is, uh, uh, we want to start with the research overview, um, and also give some good, nice tips and advices to be how to become a good uh, researcher. Uh, which is very important you know if you're pursuing to continue to become a scientist or to aspire to become a scientist i mean we will give you the maximum tip we can and then uh, we have a couple of very interesting sessions the first one i'll be leading on the material science uh, how we fix engineering issues uh, using materials that will be the key concept going forward uh, so i'm going to use two scenarios one is acoustics and the other one is uh, crash and uh, impact so I'll be using these two uh, different uh, situations to explain how a material can be used. And then Martin will be further going into some uh, nice advanced stuff like the embedded systems, need for sensor development, and some of the hot topics and that is relevant to the mega trends for today, including the machine learning. Just one note over here, jo uh, Joel. Um, um, I'm not quite sure whether you're still sharing your slides because I'm not able to see them anymore. I don't know how about the rest. Uh, okay, let's... if they can still see Joel's screen with slides. Uh, so it says host as disabled participant screen. Okay, hold on. Let me let me try to share my screen again. Let's try again. Yeah. So is is it okay it's, now? It's back there again. Perfect. So I was just going through the contents. Okay, great. Um, so without further <laughs> any more technical issues, let's get started. Uh, okay. Uh, before I go into uh, all those uh, tips that I talked about, 
what it, you know, basically research is what propels the humanity forward. You know, uh, it's fueled by the curiosity, uh, just like a small kid as curious to learn new things. Uh, he asked, uh, or she, she asked the parents, hey, what is that? What is this? The same concept goes also to the fundamental core theme of research. We get curious, we ask questions and immerse discover, <clears throat> discovering everything there is to know. Asking questions, which starts with your school, right? Uh, you ask questions, and that's also a very core theme of a fundamental research. You ask questions, immerse yourself, you put your brain into it and you find a solution to it. That's the beauty of research. It starts with as a small kid, it goes till, uh, you know, till where you face such kind of uh, nice advances in research as also, same thing. Without, curious, without curiosity and research, um, you know, our lives will be totally different and would come to a complete halt, yeah? So th that's what I would say. Without the advancement in the research and science, you know, I cannot imagine how it will be. We'll be living today. Maybe we'll be living like as a Stone Age person. That's all I can say. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Uh, uh, kindly, students, uh, do not uh, use some uh, pointers. I, I see, I see you are playing with those. Uh, okay, just to make sure. Already have slides. some nice images. Already having nice fun with the slides. Uh, good to see that. But let me do the, your job for you to show you around the slides. Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, so how a corporate corporate uh, research setup? You know, when we talk about research, I, I don't like scientists in general. You would be thinking of we'll be sitting in the lab and you know, working with pipettes and burettes. You know, that's something which I had initially. You know, was thinking of scientists or thinking of people like uh, uh, Dr. Abdul, Abdul Kalam, right? But in a corporate research setup, it's totally totally different. You know, the corporate world needs to make profit. I mean, research is very much a fundamental part of uh, being a corporate setup. There are two different setups in a corporate research. So one is uh, advanced research and development, as you can see from the left-hand side, the corporate research and development. Uh, in a company like ours, like Sabic, we, we have both of them. So we have the corporate and also a standard R&D. <clears throat> the corporate research and development the main purpose is to have a fundamental research. Uh, I think uh, I was kicked yeah, out. Yeah, the slides are gone again. Yeah, I was kicked out again. Let me try again. Okay, let's go out. Uh, the corporate research uh, setup has this uh, nice uh, time advance uh, advantage. They have more time. So they work on very much uh, fundamental research. They work on the exploration. They have much more of an academic theory based uh, fundamental research. Whereas if you see the R&D kind of uh, application-based research where myself and uh, uh, Dr. Martin, uh, where we are working, our main aim is to you know, take that corporate research sometimes, let's say, and leverage that to the customer. So we work directly with the customers uh, who has uh, hard uh, challenging problems, and we try to solve them by bringing in our kind of uh, material <clears throat> or polymer-based solution. So for us to go forward, we need to understand the market needs, problems, and then of course the management and uh, the entrepreneurial qualities as part of everyone, including us scientists is very key. So we are not just scientists working, let's, on, let's say on the, just on the scientific methodology or academic based research. We do tend to have the management and entrepreneurial qualities. And this is mainly important to drive certain programs, to lead certain programs that it goes to certain stages and milestones. And then finally, what you see is also the manufacturing and scaling, uh, scaling up, uh, which is uh, where our pro products, which we develop as a prototype, will be further scaled it up and will be sold to the market. Going to the next slide. So what it takes to be a good researcher uh, this is what, I mean, I, I'm just 10 years in this particular uh, research field. Uh, this is what myself and Martin, we came up uh, with kind of as kind of the uh, top important points that one need to consider. And also with, this is maybe interesting for the schools and also the faculties and also the students to consider uh, what it takes to be a good researcher slash scientist. Hungry for knowledge, which is very important. 
uh, we, 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 we start the day with a cup of uh, black coffee. Uh, but every day in the morning on top of a coffee, uh, we'll be learning something new. We, we, we push ourselves to learn something new because every day is a new challenge for us. So it's not just a monotonous work that we'll be doing. It's a new kind of uh, challenge and opportunity for us every day. So hungry for knowledge. I mean, if I can put this in a way like one to seven, I would say hungry for knowledge will be the top one. The next one is being a, a, a Dr. Martin, feel free to weigh in at any point of time. Uh, the next one is being a good communicator. You know, getting a very precise, clear, concise message across because you are, uh, you'll be working in a, you know, different teams. You'll be working cross-functionally. You'll be working cross-geographically. You'll be working with different kind of cultural-based people. So getting your communication is very important. So develop that kind of getting clear message, even from your, uh, this particular age when you're at school, getting a precise, concise message when you deliver something that the third party or the second person who is listening to that conversation understands that clearly. And in the field of research, it's not just a formal communication which matters. Uh, being also a good communicator means you have to also know how to write a good pattern, how to write a good paper, how to publish it, how to make it into a peer review uh, journals, for example. That's also part of the communication. It's not just communication within your, uh, within your uh, you know, the environment, but also going outside. Yeah. Uh, how do you publish your work? Data analysis. Uh, analysis, analytical way of thinking, like an arithmetic way of thinking, because you collect the data, you want to analyze that. So it's mathematics, those comes to a very important point. So you need to be way heard in that data analysis. Uh, destructive thinking, okay, now I cannot see my screen. <laughs> okay, destructive no. thinking, uh, sorry. Cre no. creativity, creativity is also important. Creativity is important. Okay, this is not a destructive, I mean, this is more destructive. I would say constructive thinking, uh, being critical, uh, right? That's very important. Interpersonal skills, like I said, teamwork. So like I mentioned, again, teamwork, working in a team, very important. Being patient uh, because success may be delayed. Uh, like in research, it's not just you put something in the system and you get the result output immediately on the same day. So we, we, we wait sometimes for our success for months, sometimes even years. So being patient and finally, no, sh no shortcuts, being, being highly detailed in the quality work that you do. All of these are really important attributes for, for a technical person, engineer or scientist to have. But on plus, as we see right now, creativity is also important and having a passion for all of these, including creativity, is is as important as any of the points that you, we are looking at right now. So, pay good attention over there. Yeah. Being <laughs> Go creative. ahead, please continue. Yes, thanks, Martin. Okay, let's start with the first. Uh, okay, no more, no more philosophy again. I promise, second time. But uh, let's go into some nice technical things now. Yeah, let's start with material science. Um, Material science, of course, as the name says, is the study of materials. This is a very good slide, uh, which, which I can show you and refer to you, basically, which shows all kinds of beautiful materials. Our world is surrounded by materials. Um, but one thing that I can say here, if you want to differentiate, maybe if you look over the period of time before 1900s, and then after 1900, 1900s, you will see a big difference in the type of materials which comes to play. Before 19, 1900, it used to be what we call a naturally available materials. And after 1900s, I would say where more research has come in, where more, more engineers has put uh, you know, a lot of times and efforts in creating new kind of materials and so on. The materials, of course, as you can see, can be classified under metals, polymers and elastomers, composites, something in between polymers and, uh, and all these other materials, and finally ceramics and glasses. So if you look any kind of, I mean, I'm not going to read through all the materials, but if you see, uh, for example, if you take metals, uh, the earliest known metal is gold. Uh, we are our, one of our favorite uh, metal, right? Uh, gold, copper, and if you see some of the new developments in material, uh, metals, you know, especially in uh, this field, you can see all kind of aluminum lithium alloys uh, you know, Martin will be later speaking about some sensors, you know, materials that goes into sensors, 
semiconductors. You know, these are some of the nice new material developments which happens nowadays. Uh, polymers and uh, elastomers, this is the field where we represent from SABIC uh, because our company is uh, producing polymers. So if you see some of the natural materials like wood, skin fibers, rubber, they are all natural polymers. And after 1950s, like over the past 50 years, uh, we have developed a lot of synthesized polymers. And some of the new ones I can think of are like these uh, high modulus polymers, high temperatures polymers. You know, these are some of the type of polymers where we work on uh, in order to solve the problems of our customers. And then, of course, you have ceramics and glasses. You can think of uh, stones, uh, pottery glasses, and their new developments include pyro ceramics, some of the tough engineering ceramics, especially materials which goes into spaces. You know, there are a lot of use of uh, ceramics. Uh, okay, so let's uh, go into a bit more detail. Uh, I talked about polymers, right? Maybe this particular uh, structures of polymers are familiar if you're learning chemistry. I mean, these are very fundamentals from chemistry. What is the polymer? What do we call as a polymer? Polymer is a large molecule uh, made up of certain chains or rings, which are mostly repetitive because uh, chains as such in a standalone cannot be work or cannot be functional. And these standalone uh, uh, chains or, or rings, uh, sometimes even like a benzene ring, are called what we call monomers. For example, this is like, yeah, complicated, I know, but if you want to break it up, if you look at an example of polyethylene, you know, a very well-known polymer, in a polyethylene, the ethylene molecule, as you can see from the carbon dub, uh, double uh, bond, and also with the hydrogen, which you can see on the left side, in a polyethylene, the ethylene is the monomer, right? Uh, this ethylene, we take it uh, from our normal uh, cracking process from the, uh, from the distillation. This ethylene molecule, we polymerize it. You know, when I say polymerize it, it means you will be treating at certain temperatures, you put some catalysis, and then you finally make what we call a polyethylene chain or a polymer, if you want to call. So polymer is nothing but a repetitive units of monomers or a, a, a chain of monomers. Other kind of polymers, as you know, is polypropylene, polystyrene, et cetera, where the styrene, for example, is the styrene is the monomer of the polystyrene. If you see the different branches, I mean, the polymers, the synthesized polymer world, um, most of this um, continuous chains of this uh, uh, polyethylene or this kind of, uh, these are what we call the homopolymers, right? where these chains are repetiting and it's not uh, being introduced with some other foreign materials inside. The moment you bring another kind of uh, chemical structure, that's what we call a copolymer. So here you can see uh, this blue ones, which is typically a ethylene molecule, for example. If you bring an additional benzene ring, for example, that becomes a copolymer. The copolymer can be uh, you know, dis uh, differentiated into alternating one, random one, and blockwise one on basically how you develop that polymer structure. The reason why I want to tell this or talk about this particular slide is, this is like, this is just like our cooking in our, uh, you know, our daily home, you know, if you want to make, uh, for example, uh, a dish, which is a very, uh, uh, the dish that I like, sambar, for example, you put all kinds of ingredients, right? You put, you put all kinds of vegetables, you put dal, you put uh, tamarind, you put everything. The same happens also with the polymer, even such an advanced level. If the, the most advanced research that we are talking about is making new kind of copolymers. How can you mix two kind of different uh, chemical structure or how can you change the, the, the structure if it's a linear structure or a branch structure or cross-link structure? That's how these kind of uh, polymers works. Same like cooking, the polymers work similarly. You add different kind of ingredients you get a new function. It can be a heat resistance. It can be electrical uh, resistance, like conductive one, or it can be insulative. So you can do uh, like a world of good with ki this kind of uh, materials, uh, especially polymers. Now, um, uh, now I talked about the fundamentals of at least some fundamentals of the materials. Uh, now we will look into uh, certain applications where we represent. Right, I mentioned application R and D. The first application I want to talk about is acoustics. The acoustics is, uh, you know, a field of study where you are dealing with noise and vibration-related problems, measured typically in a decibel scale, 
So you can see all the way from zero up to 180 uh, decibel here. If you can think of uh, uh, rustling of our leaves, which will be around 20 decibels, a refrigerator running at your home, 40 decibels. And some of the highest decibel noise that you can think of is fireworks, uh, which is around 140 decibel. This scale is normally written in logarithmic scale. So even a small 3 dB or 4 dB increase in the sound means a lot. So when I take, talk about firework, you can think about, okay, of course, Diwali is on the doorsteps immediately, right, this week. Think of that. A 140 de decibel of sound is really painful for your ears. This is not something, uh, maybe for uh, young people, it's okay. You also have to consider others when you are uh, doing this kind of fireworks. And this is really the pain threshold, what we call the pain threshold. Our customers, for example, if you see the right-hand side of the screen, so it deals with a different kind of scenario. If you see an express train, or if you see a, a desktop, or if you see a golf uh, uh, club, there are a lot of vibrating surface. There are a lot of uh, sound emitting things where we find a, a polymeric or material-based solution. How do we do that? We classify this acoustic property into four different buckets. Uh, we will see what kind of issue uh, is this is if it's a sound transmission loss where the incident sound is reflected back and there is a transmission if there is a lot of transmission which happens that's not good so this is one kind of a, a situation the other kind of situation or the solution we provide is by providing an absorption behavior where the incident sound i just want to give you a flavor of what we do to so the first one that we are looking out here is a sound transmission loss issue. Uh, think of uh, home speakers and so on, where you have an enclosure and you want to prevent the sound that goes out of that enclosure. You can come up with material science solution, right? This can be uh, classified under, if you can come up with material science solution, here you can see a mat different materials tested for the sound transmission losses, or you can come up with a filler solution. You can put, like I mentioned, you can put different kinds of fillers. Like in this example, you can put uh, iron, glass, tungsten, these kind of fillers within the polymers that it has a different kind of acoustic treatment. Or you can come up with different processing. Uh, you can make the uh, polymer uh, to be a formed polymer, where the formed polymer have a very good tendency to absorb the sound. So that's also another way of reducing the sound. Or you can come up with certain design concept, like the perforation that you can see on the right-hand side. Now let's go into understanding vibration. One of my another interesting topic. This is something you will also learn in your physics days, right? Understanding vibration uh, is because very important for the today's uh, yeah uh, uh, field because a lot of these uh, operational applications undergoes vibration. Having vibration is not good. Uh, vibration does tends to create noise, does tends to have some harshness effect. Is, this can be in a car, this can be in a space shuttle, this can be in an aerospace, anywhere. Understanding vibration is basically on this particular fundamental concept of understanding the spring mass system. There is a damper. If you put a damper inside, you can see how the vibration or the amplitude is kind of reducing. When I say damper, you don't have to think about the damper like a mechanical damper. You can think about each material itself is like a damper, especially if you see every polymer itself is like a Viscoelasticity, it has a viscoelastic nature. So it has a damper inside. So the, the moment I put polymer in comparison to a metal, I'm already getting a lot of damping. Okay, how do we determine damping from experiments? We do certain uh, model testing, we do vibration analysis, and we plot the results in a frequency domain, as you can see on the right hand side. I'm going to ask a question here um, where you get a lot of this high amount of amplitudes in the beginning when you test this one. Can somebody tell what is this frequency called as? Somebody, anyone? Feel free. This gift waiting for you for the right answers. I know Martin knows the answer. Martin, you cannot answer. You can also sketch the answer below the image, huh? just like you practiced before. Okay, what is this frequency called as? I can give a clue. There are a lot of names, but uh, one name is uh, with the German word, which starts with E. And one word is the one which starts with R. 
anyone, feel free, come on. I know you learned this in physics, so don't let me down, come on guys. Specific frequencies maybe that you have already experienced as well, maybe. Yeah. Okay, uh, due to the time restriction, I need to really push on here. So the frequency is called resonant frequency, or it's sometimes also called as eigenfrequency. And this frequency is where the, the material or the component starts vibrating really at a very harsh, harsh uh, speed or at, uh, at uh, acceleration. Yeah. Uh, so here is a good example of uh, understanding the resonance. So there, this particular plate that we have, uh, polymer plate that we have tested, as you can see, has a different kind of resonance behavior. Um, so this is how we understand uh, and also we design our materials to how to reduce this resonance. Uh, you can see this is the first mode that we, you can see there's basically a twist of uh, uh, this particular polymer plate. And we also meanwhile do simulate that in the computer models. So you can see on the right hand side screen, this is the second mode of vibration. This is the third mode of vibration. You can see all these different modes, like the, the different peaks has a different, uh, uh, different behavior. So you can see some of the uh, frequency, the, 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 the component starts twisting. On some cases, at certain, certain frequency, the component starts bending, right? So these are the kind of works that we do. Uh, you know, like uh, there is a resonance, we will be coming up with certain polymeric solution, how to avoid this kind of resonance behavior. The next one is an application testing. Here I want to talk about very quickly on the the crash test, which happens nowadays for the cars, right? Um, you can see in India, like a lot of cars being uh, publishing like five-star rating, four-star rating with an end cap. Uh, on a material level, this is the kind of research which goes in. Uh, if you look on the pyramid of this testing, the final pyramid on the top of the pyramid is where a real car is tested. I cannot make a material and I cannot put it in a car and I, can, I cannot test it, right? It's very expensive, very complex. I mean, I'm not gonna learn anything from the material. On a material level, we'll be uh, researching on what we call a coupon level test or element level test, where we take very simple structures like a small uh, sheet or plaque of materials and we'll be testing. And you can see more the higher you go on top of that pyramid, you will be making a complex structures and final product will be the one that you see in a car. Meanwhile, we do this testing, we'll be also, like I mentioned, simulating the behavior of that test. You can see, as you see, what we call a computer-aided engineering, uh, we do the simulation of that test on a really nice computer level. So we know that we don't have to do the real testing, we can also do the testing with the computer itself. Okay, I have my last slide over here. So you can see, I have taken here two different uh, components from a car. I'm gonna hit this particular components with, uh, with a heavy metal ball, yeah? Um, I, I, this is also again a question. Uh, what do you guys think? Like, what do you think? Uh, there is a plastic uh, component, there is a metal component. So I'm gonna hit a huge, I'm gonna take a very heavy metal ball, assume 10 kilograms. I'm gonna throw it away at a certain kinetic energy. So somebody explain me what would happen to the plastic fender and what would happen to versus to a metal fender? Another good chance to receive the gift. What do you think will happen to a plastic material? Will it break? Will it, yeah, what, what would happen? Will it deform? Will it, what, what would happen? So it may break easily. It may break, the plastic may break. That's what your answer is, right? Or the metal will break? The metal. The metal will break, the plastic will not break. Is that the answer? Can I take that? Uh, yes, sir, because metals can be, some metals can be brittle, can't they? Okay, so, okay, uh, give you an example. This metal, the, this metal is not brittle, just to give you a hint. Uh, yes, sir, then the plastic will break. Okay, now I'm gonna play the video. Uh, that's a very good, in, uh, interesting answer, Enoch. Uh, I'm going to take the, your answer. I'm going to interpret it in my own way, and let's see what happens. Yeah, uh, I'm going to play this video. This is a plastic fender. Yeah, again, going to repeat that high-speed video again. 
Repeat that again. Repeat that again. You can do this for a thousand times and the same behavior will happen. Let's see what happens to a metal. Again. Yeah. You see the advantage of plastic fenders. Uh, like I mentioned, plastics are very good in absorbing energy. Uh, very good material. Not all the plastics. There are, of course, uh, Enoch mentioned brittleness. Brittleness is a behavior where the materials will have a very much not an elasticity, a very low elasticity. So these, these plastic materials that we are developing have a very good uh, uh, elasticity, which means it can absorb a huge lot of crash or impact. The reason why I want to show these slides is going forward in automotive world, uh, safety is one important aspect and also safety on the roads is one important aspect. We don't consider. You can see how hard we uh, work on from the material science side that a crash happens at such a high speed, how to ask this material to absorb that energy before impacting the people inside, you know? So we develop materials to, you know, in order to absorb that energy. This is just an example of our daily work that we do, right? And the last uh, uh, slide that I want, uh, the video that I want to show, we also do simulate that in a real computer also. We don't have to go ahead and break this uh, metals every day. So we can also do this with the computer simulation. With that, I want to thank you from my side. I want to, uh, you know, uh, ask Martin if you can share your screen and uh, start presenting your slides. Yes, indeed. Thanks, Joel. So I will share my screen then. And if you can tell me actually, Joel, if you can see my slides then. I do, yeah. We'll put it in a full screen mode. Good. That's perfect. Full screen. Okay, so then uh, let me continue in, uh, in uh, the topics. Excuse me, any questions? No, some background noise, most likely. Okay, so let me just uh, uh, use the rest of the time because we are most likely quite in hurry right now. So uh, uh, my slides will be about uh, the importance of embedded systems and computer systems. And then uh, we will slowly move from the embedded systems into the sensors. Uh, so because sensor is a sort of a embedded system. And then uh, uh, at the end of my slides, I will talk about machine learning because machine learning is really benefiting from data, which is pretty much most of the time gathered by sensors. Huh? So uh, let me first then uh, kick off my slides uh, with the uh, importance of embedded systems and actually trying to actually describe you what the embedded system is. In fact, so I believe that most of you already experienced computer system. Computer systems are quite popular and uh, each of you are experiencing even right now using a computer or a laptop or a smartphone. So you basically know what computer system is. But in fact, compared to the embedded system actually is something that you maybe use even more often than your computer on a daily basis. And pretty much as out of my uh, observation, uh, only limited amount of people actually know that these are embedded systems and what's the difference compared to the computer. So computer is a general purpose machine you, that you can use for any task that you want. Huh? So that's the beauty over there. But uh, opposed to that embedded system is really a utility system. It's based on computer, but it's dedicated to perform a certain specific task, but perfectly. Uh, so, and we cannot basically, our modern civilization and world cannot be imagined without embedded systems. So washing machines, ATMs, uh, and you see the examples below. And I believe that you use them on a daily basis. So the main difference between them is basically in how we use them and what they actually uh, do for us. Uh, so, and afterwards, basically over here, I would like to show you uh, the main attributes of these embedded systems, so like a washing machine. Uh, so it needs to be reliable. Uh, it has a sophisticated function because it needs to clean your laundry. Huh? So uh, it's important for you because then you can save time for something else. Be more efficient in your, in your world, in your life. Now, these embedded systems require, in order to run, 
reliably a robust software. So that robust software is developed uh, on an intense way and actually costs a lot more than developing a software for a computer. So uh, that's where actually the main differences are starting to kick in. It has a, a embedded system, only a restricted memory. So uh, only, only a program that is designed for that system for the washing machine or ATM is inside of that memory. And also the data that is uh, actually quite important and sometimes uh, are actually quite uh, crucial and sensitive. So this system needs to be really safe proof. Now, another attribute of these embedded systems is low power. They, they cannot just consume the same power as your computer or laptop. They, they really are forced and the latest developments are really pushing the low consumption. So they need to really run on barely on nothing. Huh? And then low manufacturing cost because these devices are really produced in, in billions. So uh, basically that, that defines what embedded system is. And hopefully you will right now learn the difference because behind embedded system, there is a huge uh, industry, huge industry that, that you just uh, show, saw on the examples. Now these systems, just like computer system is benefiting from chips. Chips is really at the core of these systems. So I believe that you know that your computer or laptop or smartphone has a CPU, a central process unit or microprocessor unit. So that, that's still something that can be used in embedded system, but most of the embedded system is circulating around the second one, microcontroller. And the main difference between a processor and microcontroller is the memory. Uh, so processor doesn't have onboard on-chip memory. So you have to install additional memory. Maybe you experienced that exercise with your computer or with your laptop to expand your memory. I'm not talking about hard drives, so that's something else. That's for storing your data, your images, pictures, videos. Uh, I'm talking about memory that actually runs your program that actually enables to see your videos. So that kind of a memory and microcontroller has that type of a memory already in the chip. And there is another type of these chips uh, called the digital signal processors and uh, microcontrollers, which are optimized for digital processing. And that's there, there's a, a huge need for these. And then we have another modifications of these either processors or microcontrollers like ASICs, which are application specific integrated circuits designed for specific purposes. And they cost really a fortune, the development of ASICs. And last but not least important for development, maybe mainly are filled programmable gate arrays and programmable logic devices. So if you're going to ever come close to these devices, that means you're going to become really hardware and software developer for chips. So working on the architectures of chips, designing chips, and it's a fantastic uh, way to actually focus yourself, especially when you have a passion in computer science. So, and from here, as I said, sensors are actually benefiting out of embedded systems. So let me touch upon sensors. What is a sensor? So sensor, Joel was uh, actually uh, briefly talking about these. Sensors are really important because they help us to sense our environment. So they are able to respond uh, uh, to physical parameters and convert them into a signal that we can actually process and read somehow and make sense to us. So uh, they are really important on any aspect. Almost any physical property of a material that changes its response to some excitation uh, can be used at the end as a, as a sensor. And sensor is a vital part of, uh, of automation system. Now you see robotics, automation pro pro procedures, everything is trying to be optimized to free us, free us as humans from uh, physical labor. So, and that's where sensors as uh, our perception, as we are having also sensors as human beings, also machines needs to have a sensors. And then there are combined with actuators that actually executes a certain reaction re or action in order to fulfill automation. So over here, you see an example of a really simple uh, uh, analog type of a sensor and maybe 
only few of you have thought that microphone is a type of a sensor. But as we saw from Joel's presentation, uh, sound as a form of a, a of, um, physical property that uh, is generated can be captured by a microphone. Microphone has a sensitive diaphragm uh, that actually vibrates uh, and resonates uh, and uh, creates a signal, electrical signal that can be afterwards processed. And we can make a use of that either analog sensor, uh, analog signal, or convert it uh, through, again, what we saw before, through a microcontroller or a digital signal controller to a digital signal. And once you have it in digital form, you can do whatever you want. You can basically do magic. That's where magic is happening because we, we as a human kind have been quite good in a numerics and mathematics. And we are quite good in, a, in a processing digital informations, you know, ones and zeros, binaries, or you can shift that into a hexadecimal. Uh, it's over here for really good purposes, like even not only for self-driven vehicles, but also, for instance, in skin cancer detection or in many, any medical application. So here I'm going to just show you, summarize where, where in what domains machine learning can be really benefiting, not only in internet services that you're experiencing, but also in health, healthcare, security, you know, detecting uh, threats in automotive, autonomous driving, and of course, in any form of a science that we have, well, and one of them, of course, material science. So we can use machine learning, uh, this pattern detection or uh, um, recognition to uh, detect uh, certain material properties and organize them that way that we most likely as a human being would be never able to because some, somehow it would require a lot of time. So over here, machines, could take place and uh, try to help us optimize the materials the way that we would like to have them. So, and uh, last but not least, the conclusion from my side would be, well, we as a scientist or engineers uh, being dedicated to uh, technology development, our task is being right now being put in a great test uh, in order to increase our resources efficiencies at the end of the day. All of these effort that you saw from Joel's slides, my slides, are in order to increase, boost uh, somehow the resources efficiency and efficiency as such. Uh, so, uh, because it's must, we, it's, it's actually must. If we want to avoid any and mitigate any global impact of any scale, we have to become much more sensitive and much better designers uh, in order how we are using our resources. Uh, so, uh, ability to build something for a given purpose that is not only better than before in its utility, but also better in terms of reducing the amount of labor and energy and resources and re uh, required to make it work. Huh? So really it comes down to the design. Huh? When we talk about the also recycling plastics, when we design plastics the way that they're going to be uh, more sustainable uh, and we're going to use the resources to build these plastics, we definitely can increase our, our efficiency. So I uh, would like to actually leave you with the thoughts over here uh, at the end of the slide. The true measure of economic progress is simply doing more with less. That's uh, one big thought. And then you might think that there is a good or bad science. So, well, there's not, no such a thing like a bad or good science. Uh, it's just a science in the hands of a bad man that we shall be afraid of. So, and with that, I would like to actually leave you with these thoughts and thank you very much for your attention. Again, thank you very much for inviting us over here and uh, wishing you all uh, 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 a great experience with this exhibition. And uh, please feel free to continue uh, with the schedule. Um, if, if, if the students right. have some questions. So I, I know that maybe I didn't read it. There was actually a huge lot of chat where the questions were already raised. Uh, before I go into that, maybe I will open up uh, this session if you have time. I mean, we have time um, for uh, maybe a bit more questions from your side. Feel free again. Excuse me, sir. Um Hey. What sort of math? Yeah, so what kind of mathematics do you use? Materials, science, and all of that. 
Okay, that was also one of the questions in the chat. So I was about to address. Um, so when we say mathematics, like, um, I mean, uh, it's a vast field, right? Mathematics itself, like uh, the mathematics that's involved in a research field or scientific field, I mean, mostly concerns to what also Martin mentioned, statistics, right? So statistics is one very important field. Also, we see this as one of a booming field. You will see that there are a lot of uh, job opportunities coming up for data science, which are pertaining to uh, statistics. So. Uh, if you are very good good at statistics, I mean, there is a good chance you will be also very successful being a good scientist. The reason being is, uh, the fund like I mentioned, the fundamental research revolves around the idea of uh, hypothesizing certain things. Yeah? We, we put some assumptions, we collect data, yeah, and we analyze the data, and we make some rational conclusion out of that. In order for us to do that or to help through this various process of this basic fundamental scientific methodologies, um, statistics is going to be very key. Like uh, we talked about uh, standard deviation or somebody answered it very beautifully about standard deviation. How accurate our measurements are, how, how much is, uh, um, how much the data is, we, we, how much of data do we have to give us enough confidence to make a rational conclusion. This is going to be very key. So I would say statistics is one of the very key part of mathematics. Besides of that, if I should generalize that even more, we use basically the complete calculus, starting from uh, linear equations up to differential partial equations. So having uh, uh, using integrals, derivations, so all of them is somehow implemented in the tools that we are using or using ourselves with the programming or uh, simple tools like Excel. So, uh, uh, but, but the image that you're looking at right now, some of them like the simulations, that's all about mathematics and being able to describe physics uh, through mathematics. So mathematics is a language that helps you to describe. That's why you won't ever get a Nobel prize for mathematics because it's a considered as a language. Yeah, so what kind of physics do you use? You told you just, you, you just told now that you use physics also. Exactly. So uh, if, if I should answer from myself, um, I'm using most of the time uh, mechanics uh, and electrodynamics. Uh, so uh, electro uh, yes. electromagnetics. So uh, all of these examples that you see over here, like the radar and uh, being able to simulate the, the gain of an antenna uh, and how the, uh, the, the irradiated pattern of the signal that's basically uh, a combination of electromagnetics. And then we use actually a recent methods uh, called multiphysics that lets you combine multiple physics uh, in, a, in analysis. So you know that for instance, each electronics generates heat. So uh, we are looking at these uh, final products or components from a perspective, how they are being operated. And from that perspective, you have to check thermodynamics, uh, uh, mechanical loads that are being induced by uh, uh, thermals, and then on plus electromagnetics. So uh, in, in real world, everything happens in combination. It's not like uh, you would find something that happens only standalone, that you have only thermals. Huh? Everything affects and works in combination. Good. More questions? There, okay, there is a question on the chat. I was thrilled uh, to continue that. And then I took that as my, uh, my, uh, my doctorate uh, to uh, topic um, where I was able to develop uh, material solutions for that particular uh, component. And also uh, just now we talked about the importance of computer modeling uh, going into all kinds of field of science. It's just the same for material science. So my field was actually how to connect that uh, world between virtual world between uh, virtual uh, materials models to that of a real uh, materials or testing of materials. So that's the topic that I was so much uh, going into so much of depth that I was able to even make a lot of uh, uh, material models out of that. And I was able to uh, you know, publish it into my doctorate work. So that's the kind of work that we do. How do we connect that virtual world with the real world? 
So that's the kind of work that we do. It's not just creating new kind of materials. That, that's not what a material scientist always do. So the new kind of material science has gone so far, advanced so far that uh, we have a tendency to, to connect that two worlds. And after joining Savic, uh, so Savic itself, like I mentioned, is a polymer uh, producing company. So there is no, yeah, there is a lot of room for understanding more into the material concept and so on. So this, uh, this is a great company that I'm working now, uh, you know, providing multiple material solutions to the humanity and the world and the challenges around us, including, you know, the mobile phones that you are using, you know, think of materials that goes into the polymers that goes into your mobile phones. Think of polymers that are materials that goes into the automotive world. It's quite incredible how, much, how this has advanced. And I, just to give you an example, I don't know, like if uh, like over the past 50 years, we are talking about advancement in carbon fiber, reinforced uh, plastic, right? So I don't know if you have heard of this, this carbon fiber has a very good stiffness properties at such a low mass, which is used in uh, Formula One cars, which is used in Olympics for the cycles, you know? So this field of material science starts with your daily morning. You start brushing your teeth with, uh, with the plastic material. Uh, so, and you, you sleep uh, finally uh, end of the day uh, on, a, on a pillow, which is also materials. So. Without materials, I would say the world is void. So, um, so I'm, I'm, I'm so much, uh, I have so much gratitude towards this field uh, that I was able to contribute a small, tiny drop in that ocean. And I'm uh, very happy for that. And I same with Martin also, we, we are working for this field, you know, in order to, you know, help uh, the, solving the challenges of our, uh, of the world. Thank you, sir. Yeah, you're welcome. More questions? Uh, questions yeah. for Dr. Martin. So, uh, in the next five to ten years, can um, you know sensor technology develop so high that one day they can replace surgeons and take over surgeries and operations? Well, that's pretty much actually happening uh, while we're talking. So, uh, there are certain ways uh, that that remote surgeon surgery can happen already. So uh, with the help of uh, internet, uh, so high-speed connectivity and having a proper robotics and sensors, this will become definitely a reality over the time and will help eventually to solve the problem of, of not having enough of surgeons and, uh, and uh, problems that we are facing with healthcare as such that we can actually uh, use machines to, to help us actually solve these uh, problems with healthcare no? because obviously there is not enough uh, uh, a human being labor uh, that, that can cover all our needs no? so this indeed is going to grow and uh, healthcare is definitely one of the most important uh, industries where sensors and robotics um, uh, conductive uh, layers uh, creating a capacitors and measuring the time of charge and discharge of these capacitors actually detects your touch event. Now we have developed the material that can do the same uh, without introducing basically uh, anything else on plus like uh, multiple layers of conductive uh, material. So triboelectric material uh, and it was on plus able to distinguish uh, based on the triboelectric scale of materials what material is touching that surface. Huh? So wood was actually providing different responses than, for instance, uh, different types of plastics or, or ceramics and so on. So uh, that, that is, for instance, uh, that can be used as a sensor. So anything that gives you the response uh, to your environment in a really good scale. Uh, and then afterwards you can uh, translate that response to an electrical signal that can be processed, can be used as a sensor. Another example, as I said, uh, uh, piezoelectric effect. Uh, so response to pressure. Uh, uh, there are certain set of materials that actually respond to that pressure, uh, pretty much like crystals. Uh, and when they are getting deformed, they produce a uh, voltage difference. So. Uh, uh, that can be, again, uh, a great use, and it's being used already uh, for that purpose. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. More question?
I, I see this is uh, very interesting. I mean, uh, the depth of question and the knowledge these uh, these students has is uh, quite appreciable. Yes, sir. That's good. Sir. Yeah. Sir. Yeah, go on. Can go you on. hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. So, what are the promising polymer electrolytes for future solid batteries? Yeah, good question. Actually, we are working on this topic as well. Uh, so, uh, uh, as you know, that electrolyte needs to be solid state, so sort of a polymer. Uh, we don't have a solution yet right now, at least as, as our company, uh, what we are working on that. Huh? So, uh, I hope it, it gives a lot of promises, solid state batteries. And uh, uh, we hope that, that our com company can contribute to this effort and to really uh, produce safe batteries for the future that will have high accuracy and also high capacity. Uh, but I cannot tell you that uh, a clear answer that we are there. Uh, we are still not there yet, unfortunately, but it's happening as we are talking. Thank you, sir. All the best for you. Thank you very much. Any more questions? Sir? Yes, please. What kind of sensors are used in automotive industries? Well, there are many types of sensors uh, the built around uh, and inside of a vehicle, uh, starting from uh, the cabin, internal cabin temperature sensor, going to external environment temperature sensor. There are multiple temperature sensors, uh, checking your engine or electric motor, your battery, uh, and then going to uh, sensors like mass airflow sensor that feeds the air into your combustion engine, uh, measuring the flow of air. Uh, when we talk about combustion engines, uh, in electric vehicle, there are different set of sensors because of course there is different type of a powertrain. But then the sensors that I have been describing uh, for advanced driver assistance, like radar, LIDAR, camera, those are really like enhanced or advanced type of sensors, which are assistance by itself uh, that captures the environment uh, and create basically sort of a safety bubble around your vehicle. That's the main goal of it. Now, it has started back in 1918 with the ultrasound sensors uh, being first time populated in the, into the vehicle for parking assistance. Uh, and from that point, actually, first radar came in, came in for, for um, uh, helping, helping to, to drive the vehicle, for instance, um, for cruise control, adaptive cru cruise control. So that's one of the features where radar was used for the first time. And now it's just uh, continuously evolving, innovating for further progress. So amount of sensors eventually uh, in a vehicle will grow, uh, but not, of course, infinitely. Huh? So uh, typically the industry and also our work is designed that way that what is good enough is good enough. Huh? That's where you should stop. Uh, you don't have to overkill it. Of course, there is always good to have a, a level of redundancy, uh, which increase uh, the robustness of your system. So that's why, for instance, radar and LIDAR is going to complement to each other. So if one will fail, another one is going to take over. At the end of the day, it's important to realize which sensor is uh, taking the final decision when an event occurs, huh? when, for instance, an animal jumps in, in front of the vehicle which sensor is going to decide what to do and to create the response, to start to break. And there we actually go towards one of the most important parameter of a sensor and that's response time. So how fast that sensor is be being able to send out the signal and how fast your electronics is able to process your signal. Uh, so that's why you will hear many times about real-time applications, response time, and uh, these kind of attributes. And so on, like accuracy is important as well. Huh? Mm -hmm. More questions? Dr. Sirs, can, can you explain how does the sensor differentiate between cancer cell and normal cell? Uh, well, uh, as, we, as we saw from the images over there on the slide, slides for machine learning, basically, um, 
it requires a camera. So camera is a type of an imaging sensor. So it's an image sensor uh, that captures uh, visible spectra and uh, creates an image with a certain resolution, pixels. And those pixels are actually your digital information that you can uh, process. So every pixel is being processed by uh, an algorithm, typically a machine learning algorithm, and is basically evaluated to reconstruct uh, a certain image. And that image is being recognized by a computer and compared to all of the data that computer has been trained on. Uh, so if, if I should compare this um, architecture to a really well-skilled uh, um, skin uh, doctor, a skin doctor is, 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 was have, is definitely having a limited experiences uh, in terms of what, how many different skin cancers he saw during his experience. Uh, so uh, let me put it that way. Maybe he saw thousands of different skin cancers, but a computer can be trained for 10,000 or millions of different skin, skin cancer images. So it has a definitely higher probability to distinguish uh, even in early stages of a skin cancer. And the sensor, the most important sensor, just like uh, for a human being over there, eyes, is image sensor. So yep. the better image resolution you have, the better quality of output. Again, goes back down to garbage in, garbage out. So if you have quality inputs, you will get quality outputs as well. Yeah, there is a there is an app which is developed that we were just uh, looking at um, based on this. So uh, so you can use your normal mobile phone or smartphone, uh, which can take the picture of the of the skin or from that where you see as a symptom. And then it can come back to that database, which Martin was discussing. And it can tell you if it's really, uh, yeah, which class of skin or cancer level it is. So it's, uh, yeah, there, there goes the sensor again, where the camera is used. Eventually you want to bring down this solution to, to people that, that they can use it uh, on a normal day basis. Huh? So, uh, and that's where the beauty of machine learning and these new uh, algorithms in combination with increased computational power that we have thanks to GPUs, uh, that actually will help. Yeah. Sir, how do polymers behave when they are exposed to the biological environment, when they are in contact with some organisms? Why do they tend to react so? Hmm. I'm not quite sure whether I captured the question, your question correctly. Uh, well, maybe, polymers, yeah. Now let's take an example of maybe, a, let's say in a healthcare, for example, maybe when it comes to contact with uh, blood or something like that, because there, there are a lot of applications, right? But for instance, in healthcare, we have a special grades uh, of plastics, we are, which are biocompatible and cause actually no harm uh, to human beings. So definitely you won't use the same grade of plastic that is uh, being used for Fender in, uh, in, in healthcare applications. So that's where we have multiple grades that fulfill really all the stringent requirements for healthcare application. Yeah, so, so like uh, because in, constructively it's used in uh, healthcare industry. Um, yeah, Martin just told there are specific uh, materials that is designed, which is less toxic to, uh, you know, certain environments, especially when it comes to contact with the blood and so on. Um, and these have, these are treated differently, even from the catalysis process when they make this polymers. So um, on a constructive way, this, this should be, you know, um, resisting to any kind of uh, those kind of chemical reaction, which would potentially happen with this microorganisms or whatsoever. So there are special grades, there are special regulations uh, in order for us to qualify this material that goes into this industry. So that's a totally different uh, topic, yeah. More question. Good. I, I know uh, people are writing on the chat, uh, Martin, there are so many questions that has come Ooh. in. 
uh, I don't know if you have time to uh, go through everyone. I don't think so, but uh, um, maybe we can go through the chat questions later and also can get back to you. But uh, I, I see right. that not all the people can uh, unmute themselves. So uh, maybe, yeah, Martin, if you want to pick any one of those questions, I can also pick. Well, I see I... some questions about hydrogen. Uh, hydrogen is definitely an alternative for, for fueling the batteries or charging the batteries on board of a vehicle. Uh, it, it's being developed uh, simultaneously in parallel uh, with electric vehicles based on batteries only and charging, uh, but it's not becoming a mainstream, uh, not yet. Uh, the main drawback over here is that, that basically uh, you would be driving with a hydrogen bomb in your vehicle first, second, you would have to have uh, stations built uh, and infrastructure for fueling or, or, or getting the hydrogen uh, that you need to. Uh, and basically that would cause another challenge to build really safe hydrogen stations. Uh, although maybe some of the distribution of the fossil fuels that we are using these days could be reused for that purpose. But again, uh, working with hydrogen is always tricky. Uh, I'm saying, um, I'm not saying that this will completely hinder us from using hydrogen uh, powertrains. It just needs to become more safe and, uh, and, uh, uh, and robust enough for the future. Uh, and then again, we have to build an infrastructure. And compared to that, uh, having an electric vehicle that just needs to be, that just needs a, a charging station, building a charging station is, is definitely much cheaper than building a hydrogen station. So, um, we shall see actually which way we will go, but I see that the main trend is going towards electric vehicles based on batteries and trying to improve these batteries, charging times through uh, uh, different methods of charging. Uh, so uh, using DC instead of AC and using high currents for uh, quick charging. And uh, if this will be optimized, I think that it will just become and reinforce the, the mainstream. Okay, perfect. I mean, uh... I'm looking at the time. I think I know there are a lot of questions. Uh, I mean, we can also keep on talking the whole day. That's a different thing. I mean, if you're allowed to, because we are also on the working time. Uh, so I'd say let's uh, let's conclude this particular session. Uh, and if there is any very burning questions that you have and you want to address this, uh, we, we, we are anytime open to answer it. Uh, we'll provide the contact to the school and we are sure that we'll be able to answer it. Um, so with that, uh, thanks from our side for, uh, for su having such a very nice interactive and interesting session. Uh, and uh, and uh, we, we certainly enjoyed, I don't know, Martin. Uh, uh, yeah, thank you very much for having us here today. It was really a, a pleasure and uh, honor to be here and uh, wishing you all the best and good luck with your studies and, uh, and your future. Yeah, good luck with your studies for your exams and uh, choose the right field. Oh, yeah, there is no very good field, choose the, field uh, which interests you and uh, excellent study as much possible uh, as much uh, you can do you know if you want to do masters go for it if you want to do phd never stop learning it uh, keep asking the questions like you have done so far i i know that you are pretty much in a good direction and the right path and, and if you combine it with your passion then uh, you have a fantastic uh, winning formula yeah great thanks take care take care yeah Wow, that was a really wonderful session. Thank you, sir. Uh, we're deeply grateful to you, honored guests. It is the relentless why, how, and what if that drives scientists in their work. And it's these questions, as much as the answers, that are as responsible for the advancements that benefit the world. Science is a poetry of reality. As a part of our science exhibition, we were given the chance to express our innovative ideas. Experience, experiment, and excel. Yes, let's have a journey through the novel ideas shared by the budding scientists of our family.
a special note of appreciation to our vibrant coordinator, Mrs. Sajid Suman, for the visual treat. We are quite blessed with the presence of our chairman, sir, the man of distinct vision and a fountainhead of illuminating ideas, an idol of knowledge and inspiration to all of us. Welcome once again, sir. We need not say about our secretary, ma'am. The whole campus is vibrating and echoing her prominence. Ma'am, every thought you produce, anything you say, any action you do, it bears your signature. To felicitate the occasion, I'd like to welcome the lady with the lamb of our family, Shish family, a dear secretary, ma'am, Mrs. Vijay Jabakumar. Good evening to one and all. Am I audible? Yes, sir. As the verse says in Proverbs 16, 3, Commit to the Lord whatever you do and your plans will succeed. And I think it's very true this evening as I went through the whole program. It was a visual treat for our life. And indeed, no words. I have for the splendid and excellent organization of the whole event. And I take this occasion to thank, rather appreciate the efforts and the time which was spent in our midst by Dr. Martin Sass and Dr. Joel Tambi. Dr. Joel Tambi thanks a lot for the words that we said about. Each one of us, though we have not met physically, but hope to see you soon in future. And I'm indeed uh, happy to see Dr. Jabhar and our met today, though we are physically away. And I think again here, science plays, technology plays in bringing all of us together on one platform. And I would like to appreciate also the efforts of our principal, Mrs. Simon Samar Joseph, for bringing the whole event together. And of course, the biggest credit goes to all my dear students, their parents for the support and for the untiring efforts, the coordinators and all the staff members. It indeed was a great show. And what uh, I can say is that this clearly states that no pandemic can stop us by moving forward. And if God's grace and his presence is with us, we can achieve greater heights. And that's something we truly believe in Sacred Heart family, that Jesus is our guiding force. He's there to lead us and guide us and protect us every minute. And once again, a big congratulations and appreciation to the whole Sacred Heart International School family, from me and from Sir and from Sacred Heart School Boga. As uh, though we are here, we are witnessing, and my teachers here have also witnessed the entire program. So it's an inspiration for us too. And also I would like to once again appreciate Ms. Uh, Dr. Martin and Dr. Joel Dambi's efforts in inspiring our students so that they could ask so many questions. And really it's worth an inspiring session. Thank you, one and all. Thank you for your time and presence. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for your mind-blowing words of encouragement. Dear all, the future is always important, but not without a direct focus on the present. You possess the ability to create and nurture your future in the present moment. This means that you should always have tomorrow in mind whenever you make choices and commitments and plan before you take action. Now it's time to wind up our program. Feeling gratitude and not expressing it is like wrapping a present and not giving it. So, to express our sincere gratitude to one and all who have contributed a lot to make this occasion a grand success, I invite our coordinator, Mrs. Daphne Das. Good evening to all. Now it's time to thank all the people who made this program a grand success. Distinguished members of the program, it's been an honor to be among such accomplished individuals. It gives us a deep sense of honor to extend our gratitude. Students who were part of this international webinar were greatly benefited in a variety of ways. Innova Sensia, 
has empowered us with knowledge and strength. At this moment, we thank Lord Almighty for he has dealt with us wonderfully. The Lord has made everything perfect in his time. The great vision and mission of our Honorable Chairman, Dr. Charles Jabakumar, and the Secretary, Mrs. Vijaya Jabakumar, has come true today. We thank them for joining us and felicitating. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Our principal, Mrs. Monsama Joseph, has kept the cornerstone for the International Science Day by introducing Innova Science so her constant effort and enthusiasm made this program come to pass. We thank you, ma'am. The chief guest of the day, Dr. Martin Sass, the lead scientist, Dr. Joel Luther Tampi, senior scientist, Sabix, the Netherlands, joined us to share their innovative thoughts, which inspired the students as well as us. We thank both of them for spending their valuable time and sharing their knowledge with us. We thank all the officials representing the prestigious institution Sacred Heart School MOGA. Their presence has really made us happy. Thank you for joining us in this auspicious moment. We thank all the parents, students who are connected and are present in the program, their support and enthusiasm has made this program a success. From the bottom of our heart, we extend a warm thanks to all the parents. We also take this opportunity to thank all the well-wishers, especially Mr. Jawahar and all others who have joined us. We thank each and every person who contributed towards the success of this program. Thank you, Onanto. Thank you so much, ma'am. I request all the participants to turn on their video for a virtual photo session. That loves is always healthy. The heart that serves is always happy. The heart that cares is always strong. And we pray that God keeps you all healthy, happy, and strong. Thank you all for making this occasion a grand success. Thank you.